Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus because it's always an exciting time coming into your presence. Your word says that in the presence of the Lord, there is fullness of joy. And at your courts, there are pleasures forevermore. As we have come into your presence today, we ask spirit of a living God that you will teach us and help us, Lord, to be partakers of the fullness of joy that is always in your presence and to partake of your pleasures forevermore. We thank you, Holy Spirit of God. In Jesus' name, we pray. Praise God. Uh, before we move in into the fifth series which we have for today, I want us to have a recap of series four. Now, in series four, we saw how Ruth took the initiative of going to work at a farm, at the farm of anyone that the Spirit of the Lord will lead her onto. And we saw how, because she had come to take refuge under the wings of the mighty God of Israel, God himself led her to walk in the farm of a mighty man of valor known as Boaz. Amen. A wealthy man. God led her to work on this farm. And when she got to this farm, amazingly, because that is the way God works, God granted her favor at the sight of Boaz to the point that Boaz commanded the young men not to torture her. He even commanded them that they should allow wheat to deliberately fall on the ground so that she will have much more than enough to glean in order to take home. Praise God. When you come to take refuge under God and you surrender all to God, that is the kind of favor that you receive from God. God begins to lead you, God begins to direct you, and God begins to instruct you. He orders your footsteps according to his divine purposes. Amen. Now, Ruth was a very hardworking man. In fact, Boaz himself declared her, testified that she was a virtuous woman. And the Bible says a virtuous woman no one can find. It is only God that gives a virtuous woman. Amen. We also saw the transparent relationship between Ruth and Naomi. Naomi was like a disciple to Ruth. Ruth didn't know anybody in the land of Israel other than Naomi. So Naomi was like a disciple to her. Naomi led her. Naomi instructed her. Now, after she had gone and she had gleaned and came up with so much, she didn't eat everything. She brought some. She came to share with the mother-in-law. She appreciated our role in our life. Praise God. Now, this was where we stopped um, in series four. And so we're going to move on to series five today. Amen. In series five, we're going to be looking at the preparation of Ruth for marriage. And this was the ultimate purpose of God for her. Praise God. Now, before we go deeply into this, into, into this marriage, I want you to understand that God has only one purpose. And this purpose is eternal. Amen. It is not a temporary purpose. It wasn't something that was proposed from the foundation of this world. No, it had been before the foundation of the world. And this purpose, as I said, is singular. It is not plural. It is one. It is not two. Amen. And you see this demonstrated in several scriptures. I'm just going to quote a few to you so that you can go check them out yourself. In Ephesians chapter 3 verses 10 and 11. The Bible says, according to his eternal purpose, God's purpose is eternal because it's singular there. God's purpose is eternal. God's purpose is not temporary. God's purpose is everlasting. Singular purpose. Amen. Also, if you check out Romans chapter 8, verses 28 through 30, the Bible says, and all this work together for good to them that are decalled according to his purpose. To them that are decalled according to his purpose, not according to his purposes. So God has a purpose. This purpose is singular. Praise God. If you also look at 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 9, the Bible says, Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Amen. In other words, God had a purpose before the world began. And before the world began there is referring to in eternity, eternity past. God had a purpose. And on the basis of this purpose, he gave us grace. Every grace that God gives to you, it is to accomplish. 
accomplish his purpose. And so you see there's a connection between the purpose of God and the grace of God. God will not call you without giving you the grace because grace is the operational ability of God. It is a power of God for you to accomplish what God has called you to do. So he gave us grace before the world began according to his purpose in Christ Jesus. And then in the fullness of time, Jesus Christ came to die for our sins so that these purposes can be, this purpose rather, can be accomplished. So God has a purpose, singular. And what is this purpose? The purpose of God is to have an eternal companion for his eternal son. I want to repeat that again. The purpose of God, the eternal purpose of God is to have an eternal companion for his eternal son. His eternal son is Jesus, but he wants an eternal companion for him. And this eternal companion is to be known as the church or the bride of Christ. And that is why the bride of Christ is the ultimate in scripture. The ultimate is not just to be saved. The ultimate is that you are, you are part of the eternal companion of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is why you see in Revelation chapter 19 from verse 4 to 8, it says, let us be glad and rejoice for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. Amen. So marriage is very important. And that is why we see this to be very crucial in this particular chapter that we're going to be looking at in the book of Ruth. And by the way, you have this in uh, Ruth chapter, chapter 3. And so Naomi was the one who was going to prepare this marriage for her. Praise God. Now, God had a purpose for Ruth. And I mean the ultimate purpose of God for Ruth. This purpose, I believe, has been before the foundation of the world. And as we have been going through the book of Ruth up to this moment, even through to the fourth chapter, the book of Ruth ends in chapter 4. You will see that this ultimate purpose of God was not to be fulfilled, was not to be accomplished anywhere as far as the life of Ruth was concerned, other than in Bethlehem, Judea. And so no matter how long she stayed in the land of Moab, that purpose was not going to be accomplished. And that is why the role that Naomi played in terms of forsaking all, losing all, to bring her to the land of promise was very important because that is where the purpose of God for her was going to be fulfilled. I need to emphasize this. There are places, there are locations that God has determined that his purpose for you is going to be accomplished. Amen? And you must identify that location. In the case of Joseph, it was going to be accomplished in Egypt. And so it was necessary that Joseph was sold into the land of Egypt. Praise God. So the purpose of Ruth was not going to be accomplished in the land of Moab. No, that purpose was going to be accomplished in Bethlehem, Judea. And so Ruth had to relocate to the place where the purpose of God is going to be fulfilled. You cannot be in the wrong location and expect that God's purpose for you is going to be fulfilled there. Not at all. If Abraham had remained in the awe of the Chaldeans, even after God had called him, God's purpose for him would not have been fulfilled. You must relocate to where God's purpose for you is. And for you to, for, for you to know where God's purpose for you is, you must seek his face. You must seek his face. God must speak to you. God must give you direction. You must be led to that place so that God's purpose for you can be fulfilled. Amen. Praise God. So if Ruth and Abraham had remained in their land of nativity, that is Moab and all of the Chaldeans respectively, the purpose of God for them would not have been fulfilled. Amen. Now let's proceed. Now in chapter 1 of, sorry, in verse 1 of chapter 3, Listen to what Naomi said. Ruth 3 verse 1, it says, Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said unto her, My daughter, shall I not seek rest for thee, that it may be well with thee? Shall I not seek rest for thee, that it may be well with thee? Amen. This was a question, and also like a statement of affirmation, you know, from Naomi to Ruth. And there is a lot of volume that is spoken of here. There are a lot of hidden nuggets of truth in this simple question or statement of fact that Naomi had made. Let's see a few of them. First, 
Naomi taught it her responsibility to seek for rest for Ruth. She taught it her responsibility. Otherwise, she would not have said, my daughter, shall I not? She saw it as her responsibility. Amen. Amen. Praise God. She had realized that her responsibility towards this young woman who was, his, who was in a strange land, a, la a land that is alien to her, that her responsibility towards her will not be complete until she has helped, you know, to seek rest for her. And it is obvious from this chapter, this verse, that the rest she had in mind was marriage. See, shall I not seek rest for you, that it may be well with you? Amen. Not only was she interested in a spiritual and secular life of Ruth, she was also interested in helping Ruth to settle down, you know, in the area of marriage. She wanted her to be settled in life. She wasn't just interested in bringing her to know the God of Israel, which is spiritual, but she was also interested in her fulfilling this other, this other aspect or this other part of life, which is that of settling down. Amen. Now, secondly, she said she was going to seek rest for Ruth. She was going to seek rest for Ruth. The word seek means to search. When you seek it for something, you're searching for something. The Bible says that you should ask, you should seek, and then you should knock. And when you do this, when you seek, you will find. She says, shall I not seek for rest? No, shall I not search for rest for her that it may be well, you know, with her? Amen. Praise God. So a search is needed. She had to search for who is going to fit, you know, into the life. Who this woman is going to complement, you know, in life. Praise God. If you look at Genesis chapter 24, all through Genesis chapter 24, almost about 65 verses. This chapter basically dwells on Abraham going to seek for a bride for Isaac, his son. Very crucial to Abraham. And I encourage you to read the over nine series on the God of Abraham. Amen. We have a series, more, more than nine of them, on the God of Abraham. Abraham also had to seek for a bride for Isaac that it may be well, you know, for Isaac. Praise God. But what is this rest all about? This rest that we're talking about. Of course, it's obvious from, from Ruth chapter 3 that the rest that she had at the back of her mind, that Naomi had at the back of her mind, was that of marriage. That is, that Ruth may be comfortably married, even to the right person. Amen. Now, the implication of this is that marriage should give rest, and in fact, should be a place of rest. Let's go through that verse one again. He said, Shall I not seek rest? that it may be well with you. And the rest that this woman, that Naomi had at the back of her mind, was marriage. That means that there is a relationship between marriage and rest. When you get married, you should have rest. Amen? It shouldn't be a place of conflict. It should be a place of rest. It should be a place of quietness. Now, rest doesn't mean the absence of turbulence. Not at all. It doesn't mean the absence of turbulence. It doesn't mean that there will be no crisis. It doesn't mean that it doesn't mean that there will be no challenges, but rather it means quietness and serenity even in the midst of turbulence. Even in the midst of turbulence. You know, just like what happened to the Lord Jesus Christ when there was storm, there was a great storm as a result of a contrary wind upon the sea. The Bible said that Jesus was in the hinder part of the boat, asleep like a baby. He was at rest even in the midst of the storm. This is the kind of rest that we are talking about. Amen? Thirdly, the purpose of this rest is that it may be well with truth. Shall I not seek rest for thee that it may be well with thee? And so the purpose of this marriage is that it may be well with Ruth. In other words, as far as Naomi is concerned, it will not be well with Ruth if she is not married. Amen? And the word well means to be sound. That's the literal Greek, word, Greek meaning of it. To be sound, it means to be beautiful. Praise God. Now, this connotes the idea that without a home, it will not be well 
with Ruth. Therefore, as far as Naomi was concerned, it was imperative that she should seek rest for root that it may be well with her. And this root, this, sorry, this rest is in terms of her being married and settled down in a home. Praise God. There are a few lessons that we can learn from verse 1 of chapter 3. And the first is that in the marriage of Isaac, which we earlier referred, referred to, that we said it can be found in Genesis chapter 24, Isaac was not the one who went to seek for a bride. Not at all. Again, I refer you to the over nine series we have on the God of Abraham. It was not Isaac that went to seek for the bride. No. It was Abraham that went to seek for a bride for Isaac. Amen. And the Abraham we're talking about was the father of Isaac. Not only was he the father of Isaac, he was the prophet of God. And not only was he the prophet of God, he was a friend of God. So in whichever way you look at it, Abraham was in a suitable position, in a perfect position, you know, to look for a bride for Isaac. And whatever bride he brought, of course, Isaac was confident enough that given the maturity of the father and the relationship, the close work he had with God, that Abraham would make a mistake, you know, in that aspect. Praise God. Praise God. Now, when the marriage at the beginning is also explored, this is the second uh, important lesson. When we explore the marriage of the beginning, and of course, the marriage at the beginning, we are referring to the marriage of Adam. It will be discovered that it was not Adam that sought for a bride. Not at all. It was not Adam that sought for a bride. And you see that in Genesis chapter 2, verses 8 to 20, 18 to 22. It was God that sought for a bride for Adam. Amen? Praise God. In fact, God himself said that it is not good for this man to be alone. In fact, the man didn't even, Adam didn't even think about marriage. He never knew that he needed to be married. He never knew that there was a vacuum in him that had to be filled. But God knew because he was one that created him. And because Adam did not know, God brought him to a point where he realized that he actually needed a bride. And what God did was to bring all the animals to Adam. And he said, Adam, please name these animals. And Adam named them scientifically according to the word of knowledge that God gave to Adam. He named every animal. And the Bible says, and Adam saw that there was none like him. That is God. God brought him to a point where he would know that he needed a bride. And that God himself was the one that brought that bride. Praise God. And so we see the same thing playing out in the life of Ruth. Naomi was the one who took the initiative. And Naomi, if, if, you, if, if you have a, an in-depth understanding of that, of, of that book, Naomi played the role of a disciple in the life of Root. In fact, if you look at it from another perspective, Naomi was like a type of the Holy Spirit, you know, kind of molding and leading root in life. And she was the one that sought for a bridegroom or a husband for root. She led her in this particular process so that it may be well with her. Praise God. And so perhaps you are single, perhaps you are not married, but you're up to the age of marriage, you have waited, you don't have to fret to have a spouse, you don't have to, because that is the responsibility of God. What God did was to cause Adam to sleep, and when he woke up, he saw a bride by his side, and he could testify based on divine knowledge. What we today call the word of knowledge. He said, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. And so all you need to do is to take your rest in God. You don't need to go about searching for God, sorry, searching for a spouse. 
searching for a husband, searching for a wife on the internet or from people, you're going to be misled. Sleep in God. And by the time you wake up, when you have slept sufficiently, as far as God is concerned, you will see God bringing in the bride or the bridegroom. Amen? Adam slept. It was a deep sleep that God put him into. And then the bride came in. Praise God. Now, some of the important, uh, some of the important or nugget of truths that we can get from this, uh, this experience of Naomi and Ruth. Now, the marriage of Ruth was a second attempt. Praise God. I'm sure if you've been following this series from 1 through 4, you would have discovered that Ruth was married before this time. Amen? Now, she lost the husband in the first marriage. Praise God. Ruth, in the first instance, was married to one of the sons of this, of, of this same Naomi. But she lost this husband in the first attempt. And so God was giving her another chance. God is the God of the second chance. And no matter the number of people that have filled you in life, God is still able to give you another chance. You don't have to close the chapter. People may have jilted you. People may have betrayed you. People have promised you in marriage, perhaps even up to the point in time of marriage. And somehow they disappointed you. You don't have to give up. You don't have to close that chapter. Amen. You don't have to. No. God is the God of another chance. God will give you another opportunity again. Amen. Praise God. Now, look at Ruth. Ruth could have closed up and mind that, look, I've had enough. I lost my first husband. What is the assurance that I'm going to have a husband as good as that? Or what is the assurance that the next husband I'm going to have is not also going to die? She could have taken a decision and closed up her mind that she's no longer interested in marriage. But she didn't do that because she had a good person and the person of Naomi to disciple her. Praise God. Praise God. And so she embraced the second chance of God. You must embrace the second chance of God in your life. Hallelujah. There are those that have lost their spouses through untimely death or have broken courtship and marriages, divorce situations, and so on, you don't have to close that chapter. God is able to give you another chance. No matter how strong the reasons responsible for a relationship breaking up, maybe the death of one of the partners, maybe at the point of marriage, probably the guy said he's no longer getting married to you. No matter how strong the reason is, don't close your mind. Give an opportunity. Give a chance to God to walk in you. Ruth didn't close up her mind. And so she had another chance and she took good advantage of it. Amen? The second chance that God gave to Ruth was potentially better than the first. In any way in which you look at it, this second opportunity was better than the first. Praise God. And that is the reason why you shouldn't close your mind to a second chance or a third chance. Because in most cases, the, 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 the more the chances come to you, the better they are likely to be. In the case of Ruth, and we shall see very soon, the first opportunity she had, that first step she took, getting married to, to the son of Naomi, obviously wasn't the best from what we shall see uh, very soon. Amen. In this second attempt, she was going to be married to a man whose name will be famous in history. To a man whose name will be famous in history. It is obvious that even if the first husband did not die, looking back now, we can conclude that no matter what had transpired in life, there is no way that first husband would have made a name in history that would have been as great as the second person that Ruth got married to. Amen. And you know, and this was also the case in the first, uh, in the first marriage. And so we can trust God for the best in the second chance. Don't give it up. Don't close it. No matter what you've tried, you've made the first attempt in marriage or in any other thing in life. Don't give up. Don't be afraid that you can do that again. 
No, you can go in again. And God can prosper you in it. Amen. Praise God. She easily got married to her first husband in a native home. You know, she had that in the land of Moab. There was no problem involved. There was no challenge involved. It was very easy. They just got married. But in the second marriage, she had to give up everything. So, in other words, the second marriage was more costly than the first in, in terms of having it. In the first marriage, she didn't have to give up anything. But in the second marriage, she had to give up her people. She had to give up her God. She had to give up her property. She had to give up the land. She had to move into a strange land. It was very costly. Amen. And sometimes it will cost you so much to have a second chance. Praise God. Now look at this again. She also had to give up her friends. When she came into the land of Bethlehem, Judea, she was completely new. She didn't have any friend. She didn't have any relation. Nobody that she knew other than the person that she came into the land with. And that is Naomi. Praise God. She counted everything in the past has done. Her gods, her relations, her parents, she counted them as done for the excellency of the knowledge of the God of Israel. Philippians, Philippians 3 verse 8, Paul said, I count all things but them for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus. In other words, the excellency of the knowledge of Christ cannot be compared with all that he had lost. And it was the same for Ruth. Nothing to be compared with the God of Israel that she had come to take a refuge under. She counted all the past as dung. Amen? And you need to do that in life also. When you give your life to Christ, you got to count everything as dung. If you have not, your mind will keep going back to the lectures and the concombers that the children of Israel left in Egypt. And so their mind never left Egypt. Praise God. Giving our lives to Christ does not cost us anything. Jesus paid it all. Amen. He died all alone on the cross of Calvary. No one died with him. But to follow him will cost us everything. He said emphatically that if you will not take your cross and follow, you cannot be his disciple. Naomi forsook everything. Sorry, Ruth forsook everything. She left everything to come to the God of Israel, to take refuge under the mighty wings of the God of Israel. It doesn't cost anything to be saved or you need to give your life to Christ. But if you're going to follow him on, it's going to cost you everything. Amen. If we are going to be married to Jesus at the marriage supper, it's going to cost you everything. Just as it cost Ruth to come into the land to be married to Boaz. Praise God. Ruth was very faithful and committed to Naomi. We've seen that. Especially during the periods of her affliction. She was very committed. She was very faithful. She didn't disappoint her at any level. She didn't abandon Naomi, even as Opa did. Rather, she stayed with her all through, and she was found faithful. And because God had found her faithful through Naomi, Naomi was going to give to her what really belonged to her. When you are faithful to God in another man's thing, then God will give you that which is yours. But if you're not faithful in another man's, then God is not going to give you that which belongs to you. Praise God. We are going to stop here at this moment and we shall return shortly. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus. We worship you. Lord, we pray, O oh God, that as you gave root a second chance, Lord, in areas of our lives where we have failed you, give us another chance, O oh God. In the mighty name of Jesus. And let the second chance be potentially better than the first. We know that you are the God who gives another chance. We appreciate you, precious Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.